Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Versus Stars Podcast. Are my loyal listeners? Thank you for can you support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Jazia Axelrod boards the mothership. She's the writer of Hawk Girl from DC Comics. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Miss Axelrod. Thanks so much for coming to Versus Stars Podcast. Oh, happy to be here. It's always totally good. To, always good to talk about Hawk Girl. Like I will always do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, no I, matter I, the time or the place yeah it's so cool that ha- the hawk girl has her own series it's, it's been a long time since it's been a hawk girl long title time. title <laughs> it's been a long time now were you a fan of the hawk girl series going all the way back to that post palmiati series that came out in god how long ago has it been <laughs> it's been a while um like she's been around since uh jsa started so back in 99 2000 somewhere around there and then in about oh people are gonna get mad at me for getting this wrong i think it was 2006 uh hawk man turned into hawk girl and that was when walt simonson was was writing it and um yeah and i i was reading jsa as it was coming out a million years ago and i was very excited when she when kendra took over the hawkman title so, yeah, I've been a fan of this character almost since as long as she's been around. Now, were you interested in her first from the Justice League cartoon or was it directly from the comic books first? Uh, directly from the comic books, because the one in the cartoon is different. Um, not only is she literally different because she's Shaira and not Kendra, but she also, you know, doesn't even have Shaira's origin. It's a it's a like created for the show kind of origin, which is fine. They so, can do that. So it's a completely different character. So I usually start off with an inspiration story. So what? when did you first get inspired by comic books? And what was your oh, first geez. influences? Um, Probably the first time I was inspired. I love the phrasing of that question, by the way. Um, was one of my first comic books, if not my first comic book, which was... um an issue of The Flash that my father bought me at a yard sale. And in it, there's a sequence where he has to be both The Flash and Barry Allen at the same time to prove (laughs) that he's not a murderer. Um, It doesn't matter why, just know that that, that's the context. So what he does is he knocks on his own door as The Flash and then vibrates through the door, takes off his costume, puts on a robe, and then opens the door, takes off the robe, um, (laughs) puts his costume back on, and then is the flash and just goes back and forth really fast. Excuse me. And uses the after images to have a conversation with himself in front of a person who thought he was a murderer. And it's this ludicrous sequence. Like there's, no way this should work as a storytelling device and you read it and it's so elegantly drawn and perfectly laid out that it just seems like the most logical thing in the world and the most brilliant use of superpowers that I had ever seen at like eight or whatever like it was just really cracked my head wide open to the potential of the medium of comics Mm -hmm. and what you could do with it and was ever since then I've been hooked. Comic books, it's it's so cool. Like you can do something that absurd, and add, as a reader, you can be like, "Sure, <laughs> why not?" And it's something you could never do in like a movie or a television mm. show. Like even with how great special effects are now, there's no way that would play in the same way because it just it would either it would look too real or too fake. Mm. And like, you need that sort of suspension of disbelief that an an inked drawing can give you. So when did you think to yourself, I'm going to be a writer and which writers did you turn to and go, I can, I can be like that. Oh, I mean, very early on, like I've always been telling stories. It's something that uh, my mother talks, used to talk about all the time. 
Um, so like very young, very young. As far as like telling specifically comic stories, um, the major influences when I was like a teenager were like Neil Gaiman, hmm. uh, Grant Morrison, um, Los Bros Hernandez. Like I was a huge Love and Rocket Rockets fan as a teen. Like that book was everything. Um, because it was like real stuff. Yeah. Um, and also beautiful. Like Gilbert and Jaime were just are just amazing uh illustrators. And so to read these like very raw stories and these mm-hmm. very beautiful um laid out pages that were also oversized. That was another thing, right? Because those comics are big compared to everything else. So you had this right. big comic with these big ideas and these big personalities. It just did a lot to like 14 year old Jadzia. Um, <laughs> so those are probably the biggest influences. Um, probably Jason Lutz too. I was really into Jason Lutz. Um, Cause I was a teenager during like the black and white boom. So there was all these like real weirdos doing some really cool hmm. stuff with the medium. And I just ate it all up with the spoon. For, yeah. for uh, I will say for me, uh, Neil Gaiman is, is that one where, um, I, I love you know his books so much. I, 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 the only books I ever have in the absolute volumes of is the Sandman. It, it, it's, it's the most re rereadable book I have, and I've been, I've been trying to convince my school to now do midsummer, midsummer, the Midsummer Night's nice Dream, uh, one shot as mm-hmm. part of our Midsummer's Dream uh, curriculum. So I'm trying oh, to push cool. it. Yeah, I'm trying to make it happen, but I don't know if I'm going to. But yeah, I'll say Neil Gaiman is, is, is that 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 book is I think the closest I've ever seen to true classic literature in comic book form. Did you read his um, Mr. Punch graphic novel with Dave McKean? Unfortunately, that's one. It's one of the ones oh, I don't have. No, you need to. You no, no stop the interview. Go read it now. <laughs> it, it is so good. It's his best work. I feel like it's really both him and Dave McKean at the top of their game. Okay, doing firing on all cylinders, and it's per personal and fantastical, and like everything they both do so well. Like it's one of the best. Certainly the best thing I think they've done together. Okay. And like possibly one of the best graphic novels ever. I would totally check it out. The, well, I remember it came out around the same time with another one of my favorite books of his, uh, Murder Mysteries, which mm-hmm. is, that, that one had such a big influence on I me. Mean, that's the one with the angels and the murder, the first the first murder. In, right, uh, that's in a Canada. Grant Morrison, right? Uh, well, the guy who wrote that one, I don't know who did the art for it, but that, that oh, was one. No, of the... no, right. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right, and that's uh, John J. Muth is the artist yeah. on that one. And yeah, that one's um, it's so classic. It, it kind of reminds me of the movie The Prophecy. That kind of like those are the ones that sort of had a huge influence on me. And uh, yeah, Gaiman's one of the ones. Every time someone says Neil Gaiman, I was like, he influenced so many people. He's probably like the Stanley of like our generation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, an argument could be made for sure. I, I would think so. I mean, at the very least, maybe not from the creating new character standpoint, but far as impactful story standpoint. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and. You know, and I think he was fantastic. And um, Grant Morrison is is wonderful. So was it Animal Man? What was it for Grant Morrison? Oh, Doom Patrol, for sure. Oh, Doom Patrol. Easily Doom Patrol and, and the Invisibles. But also then like Rachel Pollock's Doom Patrol. Like I was such a huge Doom Patrol fan, like deep into that. <laughs> and like, that's a comic no one else was into. Mm. Uh, so I'd be like, this is the best thing. And they're like, I'm not reading that. It looks weird. <laughs> For me, for Morrison, I got to say that JLA run that he first did, that that was one of the most extraordinary uh, super. That those first four issues, uh, first ten or twelve issues actually, each one was just like a classic, like right yeah. after the other. Some wonderful scenes, and it was just it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, the one with Tomorrow Woman is like yes, beautiful in its poetry. So what I mean, obviously going to we got the Justice League. We um, obviously we talked about the animated series, and now we're going through. Hawk girl who did mm-hmm. show up as um just sleep just not too, in the last iteration of justice league she was a part of that team wasn't she remember she um, was yeah um that was with that joshua williamson's um run on it or she was in snyder's run and then when bendis took over mm. he kept okay. her in there okay bendis um so williamson may have also written some stuff with her i'm not now i'm now i'm reconsidering right right i'm, I'm trying to it's like it's been such a blur the last 10 yeah. years or so so he's trying to come up which ones but now did you go to them and say i want to do a hot girl story or did they come to you and say how would you like to do a hot, hot girl oh story? they came to me i was offered hot girl um which was very flattering and 
<laughs> and that, I was happy to do it. Um, the editor um, really liked what I had done with Alicia Yo in the uh, DC Pride story. And I was I had taken this character that a lot of people didn't know and weren't familiar with um, and like had given her a context and a reason to like her yeah. in a very short amount of time. And essentially they said, do this, with, but with Kendra. So, and I was happy to do it. I love that character. There's a lot of stuff to dig into. Um, and they told me that all of the continuity was available. So I could use whatever stories that happened previously that I wanted. I was like, wonderful. Uh, Cause <laughs> she does have a rich history of like really interesting conflicts. And like um, to pull that out from her perspective, as opposed to say, Hawkman's perspective or Alan Scott's perspective or Jay Garrick's perspective or Roy Harper's perspective and to have these characters um have Kendra be the one who we look at through through her eyes these stories rather than everybody else I think was very exciting to me as a writer so when you um got got the pitch to or to do Hawker I mean obviously they brought it to you but they expected you to come up with a pitch for them so what were you going to no do pitch. with it they were like, okay. do whatever you want. Just do whatever you want. Okay. So so what was the aspect of the character then that when when you're conceiving it and getting ready mm -hmm. to approach it, um, that you found as your hook to go, yeah, I got this. I know what I want to do. This is the angle I'm going to use for the story. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of it was like rereading those old stories that I loved back before. So rereading the JSA, rereading the Hawk early Hawkman stuff. Um And there's a Hawkman issue, I think number eight. So really early in the Jeff Johns run. Mm. So really early in that. And it's um, Hawkman essentially goes on a date with the Atom. So he's not doing anything. And Kendra gets to be a superhero alone for the first time. And this is the first time we really see her do her superhero thing by herself. And it's really interesting, like, showing who she is as a character and showing who she is as a character and what she does and how she does it. And also showing her, like, she's a character who struggles with depression. She's a character who struggles with a feeling of, like, measuring up and wanting to measure up and wanting to not mm. be anything less than, not necessarily perfect, but, like, competent, right? Mm. Like, she's really motivated to prove herself, especially in those early issues. And it was really interesting to me to, like, okay, that's an important part of her character then. She has proven herself, right? She's part of the Justice League multiple times over. Like if anything has, like she knows how to be a superhero now. And so what if we turn that on its head then? And like, she has gotten so good at being a superhero. What if then she's now not very good at being a person? Mm. And exploring that element was really exciting to me. Now, I sometimes um and 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 I'm not, I mean I I I, I may be wrong in this, but I feel like sometimes a character like Harko gets disregarded because uh, for the same reason like Supergirl, they're viewed as just the female version or the lesser version of the male main version of that character. You know, Su Superman is Supergirl's the lesser version, Hawkman's the main one, Conqueror's the lesser version. Now, when you're creating and writing for a Hawk Hawk Girl, how do you make sure she's established as being something? unique from the counterpart yeah well i think that's the beauty of doing kendra as opposed to the other female characters who have held that title so different from shayera hall from the golden age and shayera thal from hawk world and um other places other comics that she's been in <laughs> um the beauty of doing kendra is that she is separate from Hawkman that she has a an origin and a life that is separate from these other characters and you can tell the you can tell different stories with her that don't have to revolve around the same villains that Hawkman fights the same scenarios that Hawkman finds himself in you can tell new stuff with her and different stuff with her because she is not necessarily tied to the Hawks I think mm -hmm. that's very freeing right so you can tell stories with the Hawks, but you can also tell stories without the Hawks and it doesn't seem weird because she's kind of her own beast. So 
as far as the, the what what would you say then is her primary trait as a character that you're expanding on developing and kind of putting your spin on that that aspect of her i always saw her as kind of a knock around guy um you don't see women as that trope like that's the hellboy or the wolverine right, right? like that monster fighter who like gets thrown around but is still gets back up and's like all right <laughs> all right you got one but here i'm going <laughs> to we're going to go Right. Like I see her as a very Hellboy type character in that way, yeah. um, because she has that advantage of having a healing factor due to the nymph metal. Like she can take punishment and then get back up and be like, let's go. I'm still in this. <laughs> and I, I think that's an element that sh- other Justice Leaguers don't really have. Like Superman's invulnerable and like Batman is always going to get up. But that's a whole Batman's his own thing. Right. <laughs> and like so this sort of like. Um, vulnerability without losing toughness yeah. is, I think, very appealing and not something we see in female characters at all. So to put that aspect of Kendra's character, which is something that's always been there, and like make, make that the forefront is very exciting to me. And I really like doing that. So, you know, yeah, she's a knock-around guy. You know, I always kind of funny. Um, I used to always argue that Hawkman, it was Hawkman, but Hawkman I can say as well, was the Wolverine of DC. Uh, and instead of the the claws, you had this the mace. You know, you got this right. fake mace. And I'm th- and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, like, why was has Hawkman never been had never had a such truly successful series? Considering he is the Wolverine of his universe, <laughs> he should be so popular right now. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it's because uh, Hawk Girl is the better version. That's mm-hmm. possible. That's very possible. <laughs> we'll see. Well, I- I'm gonna use a quote from Hawk Girl three, if you don't mind. That, that, that you give you say the lives we've made the people we've become through the effort of years that's who we are now the interesting thing about i mean that's true of of it can be true of anybody but the interesting thing with heart girl is that she has lived for lifetimes so it's not just the people who you've met through her years there's years of lifetimes you know, lifetimes of years that she met multiple people so how does that statement prove especially true for her and how is she the product then of all the lifetimes she's she's had yeah, Kendra is interesting because she is probably the least connected to all of her previous lives of all the hot people. Um, like Carter embraces all of them and Shayara to a certain extent does too. But Kendra keeps them at a distance. Um, so when she thinks of her own life, she really thinks of it as like Kendra Saunders' life. She does mm-hmm. not see those other lives as part of her. And we see that in Hot Girl too. Like they are, she imagines them as literally separate people from her. Mm. Um, so that's one way. <laughs> but also, like that quote is purposefully put on a panel that has Alicia Yo in it, who is um, not only a great character from Gail Simone's Batgirl run, but also a character who's kind of through her appearances sort of like become more and more successful like she started as a no one in a garbage apartment yeah. <laughs> and like she keeps getting closer and closer to her dreams with every <laughs> successful appearance which is fun um and so now we finally have her in a restaurant which is what she talked about having and i think her first appearance so to have that character and on top of that for her to be a trans woman right and to have that sort of like conscious presentation of an identity is noteworthy and like adds to that sort of idea of like we are we are whom we present ourselves as Hmm. and what happens in the past may not entirely be as important as what is what we have consciously done Hmm. for our own lives and i think that's something that kendra absolutely believes in because she does not like to see herself as um, part of that string of reincarnations. And we get into the details of why as the story goes on, but it's enough to say that she clearly has issues. (laughs) And the the thing with her, as you mentioned, may not recognize those other personalities in in that way. However, she does have those memories. She does have those Mm -hmm. mental experiences. Can she truly pull herself apart from those versions completely? 
That's a good question because I do think the way reincarnation treated in the Hawk stories is different than the way reincarnation is treated in almost every fictional medium. Because usually when reincarnation is there, people remember past lives and that's like, oh, that's really interesting. There's a version of me who is in the past. Whereas in the Hawk people do it, it's like, oh, I am also the same person as the beginning person way back when. Right. Uh, so it's very flipped. Um, so I'm trying to treat this more the way reincarnation is treated in other fictional things, whereas Kendra is who she is and sees reflections in those previous lives, but does not necessarily see herself as someone who is majorly influenced by them because for a long time she didn't consciously access the memories of these lives like she was separated from them and they would just kind of bubble up randomly so she's had a whole life without them and i do think that's important especially when you have a character who is um not white and you say oh she's just the same as this white redhead <laughs> that's <laughs> a little problematic Right, right. So I think it's worth being like, no, Kendra is separate. Kendra does have a separate identity and a separate life from these other Hawk people. Now, we, we talked, I mean, a lot of the theme is identity of this miniseries. Um, identity, Kendra for herself, her identity away from Hawkman, her identity away from her past. Mm -hmm. um, and to go further into ideas of identity, she is now stationed herself in Gotham. Which we know Metropolis. is Metropolis. Oh, Metropolis. Okay, because she does show in Gotham and uh, is she, she visits 30. Gotham. Yeah, All right. yeah. Because I had her in there too. Okay, so so she either Metropolis or Gotham. And in the case, she's within the realm of a hero with a much bigger shadow. Yes. Um. Either in when she was in Gotham, she had Batman. Metropolis, she's got Superman. So how does that impact the her view of identity having existed in the realm of these larger characters? Yeah, well, I think it's it comes down to like her being her major appearances have been in team books. She's been a part of a lot of teams, a lot of groups. And so the fun for me was to take that subtext as text and like, oh, she is consciously seeking out teams. She's always trying to be a part of a team. Mm. She's trying to be part of a larger group because that identity of being the hawk girl who is on teams is very comfortable and useful for her. So she's like, I'm on a team. I know who I am. I'm on this team. Right. And so when just when the Justice League disbanded, right, she doesn't have the team anymore. So what do you do? You go to a place where you're probably going to run into other superheroes. And like, that's kind of like being on a team, right? <laughs> you have other superheroes <laughs> who are just there. It's like you're on a team. You're on a team. <laughs> I like people were point, pointing that out in the first issue because she's like the Justice League is disbanded, but there she is hanging out with Black Canary and Superman and Power Girl. I was like, isn't that kind of the Justice League? And it's like, yeah, it is. That's why she moved to Metropolis. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, she, she makes a reference to, to uh, one, one of my the characters I loved, we're talking about the Grant Morrison run, is Zoriel, who, mm -hmm. who, who was such a cool character. And I must admit, um, and, and it's a reference to Zoriel in Hawk Girl 3. Mm -hmm. what well, issue does that pop up in because i don't know if i if, going back yeah and an early um jsa story uh zoriel tells kendra that she is not kendra that she is in fact uh essentially possessed by the ghost of the golden age hot girl mm. so, did you, did and you like it's presented okay. as a very like like a very shocking kind of thing Right, but shocking, not from Kendra's perspective, from everyone else's. And I, I, we never really get to like delve into how she feels about this. And I, hmm. and that's why I wanted to kind of have that scene where she talks about like being looked in the eye by an angel and being told you're not who you say you are. Like that's hmm. difficult, right? And that's got to be, um, trying and especially because that's a recurring motif in Kendra's stories is that you have these men telling her who she is like over and over again and some of that comes is like a genuine like nice storytelling thing and some of it is like why does this keep happening 
And like <laughs> you see it as a recurring motif and it's it's very strange that this does keep happening, that these men keep, usually older men too, which is another weird thing, keep telling her that she's not who she thinks she is. And one of the things we are trying to establish with Hot Girl is that she is who she thinks she is. And that is more important than what other characters have said about her. Mm. Now, what, what, the thing with um, th- that scene is that, once again, she shows that she's, there's a lot of anger there towards John Jones, uh, Hawkman, Ashley mm-hmm. Um, And it's also mentioned several times that, or at least this is the concern that she's worse off because she's not on the Justice League. Since it's demanded, disbanded, she's so much worse. Some characters are like referencing that. Now, based on her, where her statements are, through, you know, some of that anger, some of this other stuff, is that just proving, is that proving that the opposite is true? She's actually better off that they disbanded. I mean, I think she is better off that they disbanded because she's finally having to confront herself alone. I think when the pandemic happened, a lot of us were like, oh no, I have to spend time with myself now. And really, and a lot of people had these sort of like emotional breakthroughs when that happened. And there was a lot of like divorces and <laughs> and things. And a lot of people like discovered things about themselves that they had kind of put aside because they were so busy being part of a job or part of a family or part of this. And now all of a sudden, when those things were taken away, we had to be alone with ourselves and make new decisions. So it is not surprising to me that Kendra, mm-hmm. when she doesn't have the constant distraction of being part of the premier superhero team of the world, is like having to deal with stuff that she had kind of repressed and not. Um, in in the series, it's also another character that is from a book that you wrote, uh, Galaxy. Yes. Now, is well, Galaxy once again is, is, um, is another character, she's kind of doing her own thing. Who's kind mm-hmm. of um, the word the right word isn't adhere to Hawk Girl, but at the at the very least, she's trying to um, em- embrace Hawk Girl as part of like a, 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 a part of her friend group, or, um, yeah. or and it's some almost like a mentorship, but it's kind of like um, it's something for it's an exchange, really, because like like we said, Kendra is someone who's focused a lot on being a superhero and not much on being a person, mm. and Galaxy has focused a lot on being a person. And needs help being a superhero. So they are helping each other by like filling in the gaps that those characters have in their lives. Now, because we're discussing Hawk Girl finding her identity away from a team, is mm-hmm. is there a way to for her is there a danger of her losing part of her identity if she kind of forms this new team with some of these other characters that are kind of in the Hawk Girl mini? No, I don't think so, because she is not even though galaxy is a superhero galaxy is definitely interacting with kendra on a very personal level like this is a friend more than a teammate and what has been fun is to kind of see galaxy bring that friendship and that casualness to the superhero interactions and you can see that sort of kind of chafe in issue three um where Galaxy is much more casual with everyone's interactions while Hot Girls is very serious and to the point. And so we're starting to see um, kind of Hot Girls' walls break down in the face of um, Galaxy's just general congenial manner. So the interesting thing is, I've been buying Hawkman for issues for a long time. I mean, I have like a hundred and something issues of Hawkman uh, storylines, and I never saw the thing about the nth dimension um nth metal dimension and or world so i thought it was me i was like what did i miss but i forget but this is a brand new a brand new thing so can you kind of dive into what that means for the hog person mythos a little bit i mean i don't want to spoil anything because we we actually go to the ninth world in issue six so we want to keep that clear but the idea is that ninth metal um comes not from thanagar as previously believed but the ninth world and it is um, which makes more sense for this metal to, which has any sort of magical properties you wanted to give it in a story at any mm. time, that it actually comes from another dimension. Um, and the ninth world um, is um, this sort of like, see, I don't want to spoil anything. It's different <laughs> than <laughs> what we've seen. Because one thing I wanted to do, because I love 
the Minetti Hawkman series that came out mm. before this. And that was a very sci-fi Hawkman story. Like there was fantastical elements to it, but it was very sci-fi. And so I wanted to flip that with Hawk Girl and to do more of a fantasy story with sci-fi elements. Mm. And so, so it feels more honestly like a Doctor Who story than say a Star Trek story. Um, and so we have the Nymph Metal. We've revealed that it comes from the, the Nymph world. Um, Volpacula, who is our villain for the Hot Girl miniseries, also is originally from the Nymph world and is trying to get back there. Um, it's obviously not easy to get back to the Nymph world. And so um, what that means and what the kind of people are there and what that means for Earth is going to be revealed slowly and surely over the next couple issues. So we get into the real meat of it in issue <laughs> four, five, and six. So, so what it means for Earth, but since we the old stories that it became is nth metal came from Thanagar, what does that mean for Thanagar too? That they have that connection to the nth metal on that planet, right? Well, I mean, that that's something that we that future writers, maybe me or someone else, can delve into. Um, essentially, they took the nth metal from the nth world, whether they did that on purpose. Or whether they did that by accident, who knows? Um, like it could have been they had a mine in the middle of their planet that was also a portal to ore in the ninth world. Hmm. It could be that they discovered the, a pathway to the ninth world and robbed that place blind of its ninth metal because they are Thanagarians. Like that's damn, open. Damn colonizers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can look at it in a lot of different ways. Um, it's not something that Thanagar doesn't really affect Kendra. So I haven't really talked a lot about Thanagar and I, I, I give them a shout out in issue six, but they, uh, their part to play in this particular story is uh, minimal. So the the villain that you just mentioned, um, I'm probably getting the name Vop, Vop, uh, Vopakula. Vopakula, yeah. Vopakula. Like Dracula. Vopakula. Okay. I'm just really bad with the name. Vop it's fine. Vopakula. Um, obviously, like you mentioned, there's this end metal world connection with her. Um, but beyond that, what makes her an ideal counter to Hawk Girl? Well, I wanted to give Hawk Girl a villain that she couldn't just hit in the face and then it would be over. Um, uh, that's the problem with having a knock around guy character is you yeah. they can't have just a punchy villain because then they'll just punch them and then that'll be done. <laughs> so it, the idea was to give her this like Joker-esque figure of someone who had lots of plans and schemes. And even if you did manage to like punch them in the face, that wouldn't mean that their plan was done. Right. Um, so to have this trickster character and also when you have an animal based hero, I don't know about you, but the first thing I did was like, let's have some animal based villains. Like we have a hawk girl. Who are some animals we could pull in? Right. right. Um Hawks, of course, are alpha predators, so there's not a predator for hawks, but there are other animals that they compete for resources with. So, um, like foxes and ravens and other sorts of things that all go after the same prey. So to I had this like short list of like animals hawks don't like. <laughs> like, who can we bring an animal villain into? And and foxes are at the top of the list. It's like, of course. We gotta have a fox character. We have to have a trickster character. Those are characters I've always loved in legends and stories. So let's bring that in. Let's have a a female trickster character, a rarity, and let's have her be a female trickster character here that um, doesn't use sex as their trickster element. Let's have someone who is just like doing something else <laughs> really <laughs> like i didn't want a, a sexy fox lady <laughs> like vulpa kula has a sex appeal to herself but like i didn't want that to be her whole shtick mm. right like so many female characters that's all they do right and so to have this character who has the ability to kind of travel down your timeline and find you at your most vulnerable and prey upon you at that moment when you're not going to make a good decision and offer you something where you're not going to be concerned about the consequences yeah. was very appealing and like a really evil kind of superpower that I haven't seen. So I was very excited to play with that. You, you know, and 
it seems so unfair because they she's praying on these kids. I mean, the one that wants a pony is like, right. oh, that's what you're going for for a pony. God, you're too young to have made the decision properly. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> like she's not going after adults who have their lives together. Like it's clearly she finds people in their lowest point and then um travels down their lives and finds them when they're going to make bad decisions and like knows that that's what she's doing like this right, is right. and I, I i just thought like god you're so of, of all the things to sell your soul for it was so important like that's such right. a child thing because you you have no sense of perspective kid <laughs> right and like what are the other ones you're like a puppy right and a race car <laughs> I mean, that sucks. It's like, come on, at least keep wait till they're teenager. They can make a semi bad decision instead of a completely yeah, bad I mean, decision. Like, well, that's in the third. <laughs> she goes after a teenager and he asks for power. Right. Which is such a teenager thing to do. And like, that doesn't end up well either. <laughs> that, that, that extremely, that's extremely true. So, one interesting thing is that once again, this is a six issue miniseries. Mm-hmm. Is a six issue miniseries with a chance of being an ongoing or is it a six issue miniseries regardless? Um. Well, it's always going to be, I think they're going to, the thing with DC <laughs> is they have a they have a publishing schedule without a lot of wiggle room. So if we were to get an issue seven, that would mean that another comic that was coming out uh, in January 2024 got canceled. And so the, there was a opening in the schedule. That's that's how that happens. Um, I don't think that's going to happen mainly because there's a lot of very good books coming out and they're really giving them all a chance. So we are probably not going to get an issue seven hot girl. That doesn't mean that there won't be more hot girl stories. It just means that right now the plan is to do the six issues and then the trade. Do we need 15 Batman titles? Is can, is there room for a hot girl within the realm of DC? I mean, I think so. I really like that they are making room for these characters that I think could find an audience if they were given the push and like to give this the push. Um, and I think the audience is there. Like the sales for Hot Girl have been very good. I've seen a lot of people talking about it. A lot of people who are now excited about like the Hawks in general, mm. having read the Hot Girl comic, which is funny to me because we don't do a lot of Hawk mythos in Hot Girl on purpose because that's a lot of stuff you don't really need. Um, but it's still like fired people's imaginations and they've mm. gone back to look at the old books, which is great. Because like I said, it, 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 I feel like Hawk girl or hawk man is, is a is a character that has never quite got the appreciation that, that they deserve within the, the larger dc comics any one time um i think like well, that... i mean Hawkman was the like the character in the golden age like this is the thing you have to remember like the idea of a guy who flew and then had a huge honking mace that was amazing that put him up against superman who just flew like right. he's got him he flies and has a mace that's awesome like a now that seems like eh, we have so many flying characters and that's true but in the golden age that was like rare mm. like what other members of the justice society flew at that time right it was like him and green lantern <laughs> i guess i guess the specter but that he doesn't count the point i'm trying to make is like he used to be very popular and i think there's an attempt every now and then to kind of like recapture that and some of those attempts are more successful than others like Hawk World was obviously a very successful attempt to kind of get what made these characters attractive and and put that in a new context. And and I hope Hawk Girl, um, which we do get back to that idea of like, you know, it's really cool flying around with a giant mace. That is fun. <laughs> uh, like that isn't a major part of the story and a part I really like. So what is next for you after issue six is over? Um, well, I am working on something else for DC that I cannot talk about because um, it has not been announced yet. It is something I'm having a lot of fun with, and it's involving characters that I'm very happy to play with. Um, but I cannot tell you what it is. <laughs> sure you can. There's nothing no. stopping you. <laughs> but, it's, um, but it is going to be in the DC playground? Yes. I'm going gonna, okay, I'm gonna to ask a few questions. Feel free to dance around them. Sure. Um, are the is is it based following galaxies more of galaxy or is it more of a uh, established DC character? All of the characters are established. I'm not making up anyone new. Okay. Hmm. Or is is this a team book or an individual book? There are lots of people in it. 
um but it's not a team book i wouldn't call it a team book is this going to feature other characters you've written for previously that are going to be prominent in in this book there are some characters that um i've written before that's not saying a whole lot i've written a bunch of them in hot girl which has been a lot of fun let me tell you um and there are some characters i've never written before which i'm very excited to do is this a re is this, is this a series that has previously existed before that's now being relaunched all of the characters have existed before <laughs> okay <laughs> you're, you're going to come back on though when, when it's time to talk oh about yeah them. i'm listen nothing would make me happier than to tell you everything about this but i can't <laughs> So, yes, I'd be happy to come back and talk about it. That'd be fantastic. Ms. Axelrod, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Oh, it's been so great to be here. Thank you and, so much. And thank you for doing a, 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 Hawk, a Hawk Girl story. Like I said, I do think those are characters that are needed in the DC verse. I agree.